ladies and gentlemen, Madame et Monsieur, and so many friends that I see in the audience. It's great to be here with you this morning. Good morning, bonjour, bonjour. And welcome to day two of this conference. I understand that yesterday was a very full day and I'm delighted that you're all back ready for uh, another day of, uh, of conversation. It's such a, a privilege for me to be here as you engage in an important dialogue and personally it's uh, a particular privilege to be able to hear Professor Kotler. Uh, so I will be brief in my remarks as I know you'll be wanting to focus on him. The work that you're doing and the conversations you're having are very significant for our nation. They go to the heart of who we are as Canadians, who we want to be, and crucially, how we get there. This conference asks us what we can do, both individually and collectively, to achieve a society that is truly just and sustainable. Your invitation to bring greetings this morning actually caused me to reflect a little on my own personal experience with race relations. My own journey has taken me from Northern Ireland, where I was born, to Saskatchewan, where I was raised, to Kenya, where I worked with the United Nations, and then to Toronto, the world's most multicultural city, with many places in between. Interestingly, it's only been in the last few years that I have found myself frequently identifying as an immigrant. Growing up in small town Saskatchewan, it was not my race or my heritage that made me different. It was that I was the daughter of the minister and a teacher that restricted my freedom. My knowledge of people from other countries and backgrounds was limited to the local Chinese and those from Eastern Europe. And occasionally, but in a very limited way, I learned about First Nations and Métis people. Well, needless to say, there was a certain amount of cultural shock then that came from living in the heart of Africa, from visiting and working with almost 200 nations around the globe. And it was a rare privilege to learn about the issues that we share in common, but also the variety of approaches to social problems from which I could learn. But one of the greatest opportunities was in fact to see my own country from a different perspective, through a different lens. And I came to know how very privileged we are, how very rich in natural and social capital, and also how Canada is viewed by many around the world as a beacon of hope. And now as Lieutenant Governor, I often ask myself, how can I use this amazing platform and the convening power that comes with it to encourage social cohesion and belonging among Ontarians? Certainly as we approach the 150th anniversary of Confederation, I note that our constitutional democracy that has served us so well has actually encouraged evolution rather than revolution. And I'm one who believes that the Crown has an important role to play in fostering inclusion. The most recent example of this, of course, was the initiative of the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge when they met with Indigenous communities and Syrian refugees during their recent tour of British Columbia and the Yukon. By doing so, they focused attention of all Canadians and people around the world on how we are actually working, sometimes slowly, to address injustices. Here in Ontario, it's become apparent to me just how passionately First Nations celebrate their treaty relationship with the Crown. So the Office of the Lieutenant Governor has been very proud to host representatives of Indigenous communities, survivors of residential schools, on several occasions. And we're learning of hopes and dreams and much unfinished business. The first steps toward reconciliation are being taken, but the journey has really just begun. I'm convinced that we must deal directly with this part of our history, 
because it still affects who we are as a nation. We can learn from collaborative initiatives involving Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples working together, such as the Friends and Neighbors Group, which is dedicated to preserving the Mohawk Institute in Brantford, Canada's oldest and perhaps ugliest residential school. Only through unflinching dedication to learning the lessons of the past can we begin to move forward in hope. And indeed today, in this place, I acknowledge Toronto as a sacred gathering place for many Indigenous peoples of Turtle Island. I pay tribute to the ancient and enduring history of First Nations and Métis people in Ontario and show respect in particular to the Mississaugas of the New Credit. As Lieutenant Governor, I've also had the privilege of welcoming refugee families from Syria. And while I was moved by the emotions of uncertainty and joy, I was also heartened by the warm reception that they have received. But we must be vigilant, ensuring that those refugees have continued support as the transition to meaningful, meaningful citizenship in our country will require concentrated attention over time through the daily process of creating a new life and finally belonging. I was given hope just the other day when it was so inspiring out at uh, Sir Wilfrid Laurier University where I saw the tremendous effort that's being made in embracing international students, two young women from Syria in particular, where they have placed diversity at the, at the very center of their student experience, center of campus life. So those are just two examples of the diversity of this country. But I think they are enough to show us that what's most essential is to spend time in genuine dialogue if we are to understand each other and not fall prey to the rhetoric of fear and hate that we hear elsewhere. For we are not immune to prejudice. Consider, for instance, the Hindu temple in Kitchener, the mosque in Peterborough that were vandalized last year in the wake of the Paris attacks. And earlier this month, a UN working group visited Canada to study anti-black racism. Clearly, we also have important work to do. So my thanks this morning to the Canadian Race Relations Foundation for hosting this conference and for the work that you do in research, education and training to help alleviate discrimination and systemic inequity. It does make a difference. To today's speakers, thank you for your dedication to inclusion and for sharing your ideas and experiences with us. And to the youth ambassadors whom I just met and who'll be facilitating your discussion, thank you as well for your time, your devotion, and your confidence in being able to perform this task. Your input is very much valued and I look forward afterwards to reading the report on this conference. So I wish you all a most productive day as we look forward to marking the 150th anniversary of Confederation next year, I hope that we will all be united in the belief that the tighter we knit ourselves together as a community, the brighter our future will be. And I'm optimistic that with your help, we can steer a course towards realizing our real promise of reconciliation and our real promise as a nation. Thank you, merci, miigwech.